Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good, good. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Tommy, and good morning, Norman. Good morning. Okay. Uh, more than ever in the 21st century, anti racism and decolonial practice are of our present. On May 26, police officer Derek Chauvin assassinated George Floyd at 46 years old, unarmed black male in Minneapolis. The footage of the murder instantly became viral on internet, arousing outrage through the United States and beyond. We have become used to what our guest, Professor Tommy Curry called, I quote, dead niggers made into YouTube sensation, unquote. Black males are routinely the protagonists of widely broadcasted snuff movies whose police anti-black brutality stage the macabre mise en scène. But this time, the outrage went from the screen to the streets. The death of George Floyd gave rise to a series of political demonstrations that some journalists label as the most massive since the civil rights movement. We have seen immense and intense uprising in Minneapolis, but in other US cities as well. But the movement did not stop. Cities like London, Berlin, Paris, Cape Town, Amsterdam, or Brussels witnesses thousands of protesters claiming their hostility towards racism, policing, and rampant necrophobia. Of illustrious genocidal colonialism and slave orders have been knocked down or decapitated in the context of George Floyd rallies. So the question of decolonizing the public space ended up becoming integral part of the conversation. What are the causes of this sudden international internationalization of anti-racist struggle? And what should we expect of this global movement? Nevertheless, despite an appearance of coherence and global communion, we should think about tension and contradiction within the anti-racist movement. For instance, we heard some intellectuals and activists targeting black males being too often depicted as the primary victim of police brutality, despite that claim being factually accurate. In addition, we can see a tension between an objective interpretation and a subjective interpretation of our present political moment. Very often, they intersect, but I believe there are two strong tendencies. The first one is the most perversive, some people believe that the protest rallies and rebellion are about reforming and defunding the police or social justice and redistribution. Such an, an interpretation is what allow a massive number of white leftists and liberals to join the protest and mix their own demand with the now traditional slogans in favor of black lives. We are witnessing the renew of hope in a radical political coalition and it is true that we may very well expect some improvement in the way America conceives policing, but would it be enough to eradicate the cause of black exasperation? On the other hand, maybe should we understand those revolt as uprising against anti-blackness as such, against the decimation of the African-American population during the COVID-19 epidemic, against senseless murder such as Amod Arboris and many other forms of dehumanization and indignity the black community disproportionately faces. And does this light, the most significant dimension of our present moment does not rely on the political demands we are articulating, but rather on the rising and consolidation of a black self consciousness and revolutionary political imagination. So, how can we think the relation between a multiracial reformist political agenda and the political heritage of black radicalism? Is the question of black liberation condemned to be watered down within the very revolt black people start and untotten it? Please, uh, Nel, um, Norman and uh, Tommy, 
the yes. floor is yours. So, uh, great to have you, Tommy. Uh, thank you for thank the you. Uh, invitation, Mireille. So, uh, many, many things have been said, and um, I just, I just wanted to have your impressions, Tommy, about this, this present, this present moment. And uh, yeah. Mireille quote, um, you know, something that is at the very, very start of your book. I mean, it's the starting point, the very starting point of the experience that starts our journey. That. that that is your book, that is to say, this pervasiveness of images of snuff movies that uh -huh. um, black lives, uh, black male death are rendered into. So yeah. how do you feel about this uh, yes. of um, George Floyd's, uh, George Floyd's death, the effects of this footage? Um, yes. How, What's your, you know, what's your sentiment? What's your feeling about, about the world? Well, well, thank you, thank you. Um, you know, there, there's always tremendous sadness in, in writing a text that tries to predict a pattern of death uh, for, for your own people. And George Floyd is part of the process of the corpse being made out of black male flesh throughout the centuries in the United States. Uh, one, of the, one of the most disparaging aspects of what we're dealing with here is that we're going to see the repetition. This is going to continue repeating uh, over and over again until we understand that the very basis of anti-Black racism, especially in the United States, is to manage Black population. You know, one of the things that I start the man not off with is the horrible sights and the way that those the dead bodies of black men are proliferated throughout the world and the world identifies not with the humanity of black males but the corpse their rotting flesh and it's this kind of relationship where the representation of the black male is as the dead body right that creates the kind of problem and relationship the tension that we have claiming that we actually support black life. Through the, dead, through the dead body of the black male, all sorts of careers, public intellectual platform, even money is given to the benefactors of, or, or the family members of, of the person killed. So in a world where black men, as we talked about before with, during the beginning of the COVID crisis, are often denied work, are often incarcerated, are often excluded from mainstream society, the corpse is rendered as, a, as almost a reward in the sense that the black man dying is the only way that certain conversations about black men's life, about who black men were, certain kind of resources can flow to the families, right, that were denied to black men in there while they were actually working. The corpse represents the anchor of how we locate and understand black men and boys throughout the world. So when you see the death of Mr. Floyd, it's not just that you see the public lynching of a black man, but you see people standing around watching the public lynching of a black man. That you see the world responding to the public lynching of a black man, but have no concern for the conditions that allow thousands upon thousands of Mr. Floyds to exist at any point in time throughout American history. And this is and this is what I'm, I, I would like to highlight. We become outraged when black men die, but do we really care about their lives and the conditions that they live in? Mm -hmm. Right. So we're we're marching for Mr. Floyd. That's one person. But the data suggests that over the last five or six years, there've been almost twenty three hundred Mr. Floyd. So so can we truly comprehend? And this is the problem that I have when we talk about decolonization and anti racist thinking. Right? What is it about our, our embrace of certain ideas and values that allow the conditions that negate those values to, to continue unabated and without protest? So you can have people saying now, oh, we're anti-racism, we want movements, we want change, Black Lives Matter. But all the arguments that have been coming on social media, even from Black intellectuals in the United States, has been a complete condemnation of Black culture. So there is arguments saying that, oh, Mr. Floyd, that they're trying to censor while well, he was a criminal. 
right? We know we, we've rehearsed this role over and over again. He was, he was an abuser of women. He didn't marry a black woman. The black culture is violent. So it seems that every time there's a, a need to persist or to endure, right, in a long struggle to, to fight against the dehumanization that black men and boys suffer in the United States, which all police to the death, there's, there's simultaneously from the same people claiming to do this march and to engage in this humanizing praxis to be the negation, to say but black men are X. And it's this kind of tension that gets represented in the corpse. That yes, they, maybe the cops shouldn't have killed the black man, but living black men are dangerous. Living black men are threats. And now the debate isn't over the life lost with Mr. Floyd. The, the debate becomes much bigger. Well, are black men, is black culture violent? And now how do we protect the people in the community that we care about from these brutes and monsters? And this is why I said that the whole act of becoming a spectacle is mm. fundamentally acting against the negation of humanity. Mm. Because it allows, it allows the, 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 the dead black body to be given to the public and then ask the public to make an assessment of what you think that life is. There is nothing endemic to the black male itself that speaks or breathes humanity or life. And this is what we're constantly doing. We're constantly reinterpreting. We're constantly imagining, we're constantly translating, is this black man one of the dangerous black men that we all know we really are afraid of, that we want to lock up in prison? Mm -hmm. And Mr. Floyd has shown us time and time again, over the last few months, that there is no sanctuary for the, for the notion of the human within the black male body. There is no soul there, so to speak, that the world is reacting to. The world is reacting to the outrageousness Right? Yeah, this is this is what's offending white people in Europe, right? The outrageousness of a Western civilized democratic country performing that kind of brutality in public. Because make no mistake, right? We know that they performed this brutality throughout colonialism. We know what the British did in Kenya, right? We know what France did throughout our Africa. So there is not there is not a denial of that, but the pretense of Western mm -hmm is based on civility. And the outrage is a performance of breaking the sacred trust of the, the, the image, right, of what the civilized Western society should be. This is not a protest about the life of a black man that was lost. And I think that the debates that we've seen emerging, right, over trying to replace the question of Mr. Floyd with other more suitable bodies, so making sure that, you know, we focus, for instance, on, on black women, instead of black men, the arguments about whether or not Mr. Floyd was violent or nonviolent, the, the, the idea that we should not protest his life because he wasn't with a black woman, but was, was with a white woman. These are all the kinds of tropes that have historically been activated in the United States every time a black man was lynched. And unfortunately, in the 21st century, I don't see them stopping anytime soon. Yes. Yes, I, I see in... We see it in, in, in France and in the U.S., as you said, um, people, or at least some people, many people, are not uh, protesting, as you said, against the very fact of black males are being killed, but they do not want to see themselves in a position of being associated with this, with this kind of violence. Yeah. Uh, as, <clears throat> also, as you said, um, we are now witnessing a very strange shift in the conversation. And you um, mentioned some aspect of it, but I, I'd, like, I'd like to hear more about it. This conversation around um, black males are being um, unfairly or not legitimately at the center of the conversation, right? Yes. That, yes. As if black males were depicted as primary victims of those crimes and uh, as if it were something incorrect but we know and you mentioned those data very often and those data are coherent in i mean any western country and uh, any western country and I think beyond that black and brown males are predominantly victims of police killings right yes. it's not something we made up it's just the fact but some activists, some intellectuals are saying that those protests are unfairly um, 
focusing on the death and uh, killing of black males. And why are those people, in your opinion, why are those people so violently, angrily defending something, an agenda which is so far from the truth? <laughs> why, 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 why are they so committed yes. to erase um, black males? <laughs> Those people are pushing um, deliberately, they're pushing an agenda which mm -hmm. is not grounded upon the truth, which is yeah. just, an, a, a, I mean, an agenda which is, of course, um, the point, no one saying that some black lives, uh, some, bl some black people being killed are not to be acknowledged for that. That's yes. nobody is saying this. No, no one, absolutely, absolutely no one except for, um, ex except for white supremacists and some people who have problems and issues with black males. But what I'm saying is that it is not incorrect and it, it, it makes sense to focus on, on black males if they are the primary victims of police violence uh, historically and in our present. But why, uh, why are we witnessing this um, willing, this willingness to decenter the conversation, which is supposedly too much, uh, too um, heavily centers, uh, centered on, around black males? I think, I think we have to readily acknowledge that there are some discourses that masquerade themselves around as liberatory or that are fundamentally antagonistic to black men and other poor uh, populations of black people in the United States. Uh, when, when we're talking about the, the activism that comes from, uh, say, her name and other black feminists in the United States, they, they feel an antagonism. To, to black men receiving any forms of attention that does not include black women. And the irony of this is that when you look at the data they present um, to support these efforts of always including black women, uh, it works both ways. So for example, while it's certainly true that black women and black gay and trans peoples are killed at the hands of the police because they're black, um, it is also woefully true that the majority of the people that are killed are black men. When you look at the type of data that they uh, offer in support of sexual assault by the police, they focus on black women. They completely exclude the fact that black men have, have been sodomized, have been raped, have been penetrated through guns, screwdrivers, batons. Uh, they, they ignore the fact that you know, black men suffer from domestic abuse the same way that black women, black trans individuals do, black same sex couples. So it's a selective outrage. It's an outrage that's designed to form an antagonism between black men uh, and their status of victims. And what we have to do, we have to be more forthright in becoming aware of how these apparatus and these theories and ideologies uh, operate to actually dehumanize uh, black men and boys. There's nothing wrong with saying that black people are killed. It's true. I don't know any black male I've spoken to in the last two or three years that's denied that black women get killed by the cops. But there is a very real concern that the movement based on intersectionality, right, is not only trying to center or bring attention to black women killed, but rather trying to replace black men as the primary victims of this kind of violence. And when we see that phenomenon, I think we have to ask the question, why? I think there are two important things here. One. The dehumanized status of black men means that very many people can't empathize with their humanity. So the people that are aiming to move into key political positions and become political pundits understand that for an American white public, the only people that are going to feel compassion, right, that are capable of receiving compassion and sympathy from a white liberal public is going to be black women or black trans or gay individuals. Black men don't have that kind of gravitas in their view because too many white people fear them. So they're, they're trying to try substitute the victim. They're trying, to, they're trying to benefit from the racism and the anti-black misandry of the white liberal that they're doing business with to bring a black male body 
uh, to push the black male body from the center to the background and replace it with a black female body. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I think this is the fundamental uh, problem with intersectionality as a political theory. Uh, in my book, I discussed the theory of intersexual invisibility. Uh, it was a theory that was developed around 2008 by two psychologists. And what they argued was that the subordinate male target hypothesis introduced by Jim Sedanius and Felicia Prado in 1999 was overwhelmingly true. That Western capitalistic societies throughout the 20th and 21st century seem to target racialized or subordinate men with lethal violence. The idea is that white Western patriarchies try to remove, right, racialized men, black men from the society to maintain hierarchy and order. Now, when the intersectionality theorists had to confront this data, they couldn't refute it. So what they said is that we have to reinterpret this data. We have to now say that, well, even though black men are overwhelmingly the direct uh, targets of oppression and lethal violence, we have to mark that as a kind of privilege. We're gonna say that in patriarchies, patriarchies privilege men over women, so that's why they kill and target. And in this article, they said, well, look, since we cannot overturn the evidence, we have to look away from it. The main issue is gonna be recognition. And it's this theory that's being played out on a national scene right now. Because no matter how many black men are killed, no matter how many black men are removed from society, the argument is recognition. We need to recognize the people that are not being recognized right now. So they want to complete, notice, notice the anti-empiricism of the claim. You can commit genocidal level violence against certain groups of people. You can wipe out whole populations of black men through prison, the prison industrial complex, police homicide, intra-racial violence homicide. We, you know, and no one will care because the argument's gonna be, but we're not talking about black women. We're not talking about black same sex couples. We're not talking about black trans bodies. So it's a way, it's, it's become a popular idea in the United States because it's a way for us to now not have to talk about the undesirable. We don't have to focus or center black men even when they're the most disadvantaged. And this is why I say that this is a dehumanizing, this is not liberatory. Saying, saying that people who are the primary victims of, of, a, of a, a horrendous violence shouldn't be centered as victims doesn't do anything. Because think, think about the contradiction here. If black men have all the recognition, but they're, be, but they're 95% of the people being killed by the police, what do you think recognition is going to do for black women? The whole point is recognition doesn't save black people's lives. Because if black men have it and they're still dying, it's empirically denied that recognition saves lives. But, this is, but they're not interested in a, in, a, in a sound or logical argument. They're interested in the attention. They're interested in what the, the kind of jobs, right, and profiles they're going to get off this backing. And they're interested in making sure that white liberals have a vulnerable black subject that they could co-sign on. This is why the Democratic platform was all about black women, black trans issues, black same-sex couples issues. And despite the increase of police homicide and the activism of Black Lives Matter, Black men as a group would never approach once. And this is why I say that we have to be very suspicious of the kinds of reformist ideologies that are masquerading as if they're racially liberatory. This is a class-based phenomenon that is encouraging white liberals to look away and condemn poor black people, especially poor black men, and replace them with more suitable, more, more respectable versions of a victim. And until we start dealing with how this bourgeois right, and, and capitalist model of activism and, and, and um, a, a careerism, right, our, our infiltrating movements, then we're not going to have a very rich discussion about a house, how to save Black people's lives. There's no other group in history that have been competing for who gets the attention after people are dead. I can't find one single, I'm serious, I can't find one single historical reference for a claim made by any oppressed group throughout history saying that we're going to compare dead bodies and the people who get more media attention for the number of dead bodies is what we're gonna fight over. It's an, it's an embarrassment to the idea of radical black struggle. And it's an embarrassment to the idea of black humanity by saying that we should not talk about, right? The very process of making rotting meat 
right? Dead flesh out of black bodies because we want to divvy it up, right? We want to divvy it up based on gender and sex. And somehow these politics are thought to be, to be transformative. Somehow speaking and broadcasting that other black people are dying is supposed to be liberatory, but it never stops who's dying. Mm -hmm. It's never arrested. It's never paused and said, we have to stop killing black people. We're just trying to profit off of the after effects. I think, I think it's, I think it's tremendously dishonest and it doesn't even, it doesn't even take care of, right? The black women who they claim, are, right? Our, our point here has to be understanding the origin, understanding the function, the need of Western democratic societies to kill black people, to understand the specific strategies to eliminate and remove black men from these societies, and then to deal with policies that are specifically targeted to addressing that. That's not gonna come from, from intersexual visibility or coalitional politics. Yes, of course. And I see a, a very strange uh, movement, mm -hmm. which is certainly grounded in the political history of the United States. Yes, yes. And you see, throughout American history, I think black people have been the most constantly and surely the, the, the most revolutionary uh, group, the Absolutely. most revolutionary demographic throughout the mm -hmm. US. And here you see, there is no, in a way, there is no revolutionary class except working class black people in America, I think. Exactly. And this, this present day's protests have been started by this class. They've been started by this group. But very soon, many different people went claiming um, this, this, re this rebellion, right? We've seen um, white liberals, white leftists, and well, maybe it's necessary, right? It's necessary to have something like a coherent um, political coalition, but usually the move was to water down black-centered agenda Absolutely. in order to have a way more, say, liberal agenda to replace it, right? Yeah. Talking not about police brutality, not about black dehumanization, not about black issues, but social justice at large, but uh -huh. uh, things like improving policing in, a, in, in a, let's say, reformist way, and yeah. even things about gender equality or, or things which have nothing to do with was at stake right. uh, in Minneapolis and what is at stake for many, many years in the United States regarding black life and black death. Absolutely. So what I, I, I'm preoccupied with is the way black death, but also black protests, black political power, because it is a form of political power, right? They, they, yes, they burn right. down police stations, they burn police stations to the ground. It's not something, it's, mm -hmm. some, it's not something, yeah. it's something we have to acknowledge, right? It, it is yes, a yes, form yes. of, I mean, revolutionary power, which, which is quite uncommon in Western democracies right now. But mm -hmm. the move was not only to delegitimize what they, what they did uh, libeling them as looters and things like that, which was also internally a way of replacing their claims or taking mm -hmm. their voice and trying to make them say things those early protesters mm -hmm. were not saying, right? Yes, and absolutely. Your international intersectional discourse, but also liberal discourse, uh, uh, social justice stereotypical discourse are tools in order to deprive black people for from their own politics and, and from their, their their own voice. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and and I think that it's important to understand the trajectories of these kinds of interventions throughout history. The, the idea that white people would put their bodies on the line and give us against um, a, a police state uh, is foreign. Right? White people throughout history have not been the ones to say we will die for the greater future, uh, you know, uh, especially in terms of if black people are involved in that. So there's an, an 
an understanding by white liberals, by the white liberal, that black bodies are disposable. So if black bodies are putting themselves on the front lines of social protest, dissents, and activism, they can use this moment. They can use this moment against the police, et cetera, to energize their own interests. And let's be very clear, under COVID-19, there's been a huge delegitimization of the social contract from the U.S. government. Um, the protests for Mr. Floyd and Ms. Ar uh, Mr. Arbery uh, and Ms. Taylor are the only thing going on that allows the population to engage in a public display and vent their anger. This should not indicate in any serious way a commitment against anti-Blackness is certainly not a recognition of the kind of dehumanization associated with anti-Black misandry. This is just the explosion of a population that's disappointed in the kind of benefits and the kind of recognition that democracy gives to white life. Because COVID is disproportionately killing, or is, 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 is killing uh, white people in a way that white people are not used to dying. This, is, this kind of death is usually for poor people, black people, and migrants, right? So that's a frustration in the society. Now this co-optation that we see through other voices, they, this is just selling poor black people for profit. And we have to be very honest about that. You know, one of the reasons that I liked Elaine Brown's book, The Condemnation of Little B, is because she said that there's a new class of racism basically co-signed and, and, and um, enacted by the bourgeois class of intellectuals and politicians. You know, and it's, and it's always struck me as, as, as ironic that for the, the Black feminists and the feminists who don't want to see themselves in line with these kind of carceral logics, right, because they're appealing to the state, they're appealing to police, right, to protect Black women from the bad Black boogeyman. It's funny to me that how they don't understand that they are basically the same kind of people that's giving legitimacy to this, this battle where the state needs to be militaristic, needs to kill Black people, needs to kill Black men to keep other people safe. So when these other voices come in to co-opt, they're energizing the dissent that already exists within the Black race. They're coming in and they're fueling the flames. It's not a coincidence that for the last three or four weeks, all the debates around the movement have been how violent is Black culture? How violent are Black men? How much a threat are they to Black women and girls? Right? These are ridiculous questions. Ridiculous questions. Right? Because we know where this violence happens. We know this violence usually happens in poor communities. We know this violence usually happens to people who are underserved and impoverished. But again, this is who they're not trying to turn your eye to. They talk about poor Black people when they need an image of a deviant, criminally dangerous Black male. They turn away from it when you have to start looking at that within the context of homes, the context of mothers, the context of relationships, the context of people interacting every day. They don't want to show the white world those Black people. So what do they do? They build up a sacrificial lamb. They build up an image of Miss Taylor. And they give that to the world to say, see, this kind of person is being neglected, right? This person is being ignored. But Miss Taylor is, is just like any of the thousands of Black men, decent human beings working, struggling, trying to survive in America, which is under Serge and DeMarge's lives. Mm -hmm. right? these, these are conversations that are started in reaction to, not ones that are started as a way to, to actually supplement and, and give voice. Because none of the white groups, this is the thing, none of the white groups, right, the white gay, the white trans movement are suffering or are marching for any, any of their victims. So if they, if they see the parallels, Where's their pronouncement saying that we too have been disproportionately killed? Why are they, why, where was their energy about defunding the police if the police were targeting white gay communities, right? Or white trans communities, you see what I'm saying? There's no energy from their side. There's only cosigning. And when they cosign the black ener uh, energy and protest and resistance, they then say, well, look, let's take this part because it's really about, right, how gay or trans communities are being erased in all these cis communities. Right? This is the problem. And Black people keep acting like they don't get it. But the bourgeois class gets it because the bourgeois class is selling Black bodies for profit. They're, that's, they're profiting over this. That's why they're on CNN. That's why they're in the New Yorker. This is why they're in the Washington Post, all getting spotlight. Oh, everybody's book is selling. But nobody's actually asked the question. Well, then if if we're going to take this moment and make money off of these poor black bodies that are being killed and hauled off to the morgue, 
how do how, how do we stop it? Why does this, why does the world function in this way? None of the books on the New York's bestsellers list that's being pushed almost incessantly on social media addresses the one fundamental question, which is why do they seem to want to kill black people? Not a single one that everybody's reading now. We're all we're talking about anger. We're trying to figure out that America's racist, but nobody seems to care why black men are being systematically removed from the society. And that's not by accident, right? Sylvia Winter said this in No Human Involved, right? That is that is the poor urban black male that's been made to pay for the consequences of a middle class division or middle class black society. So the whole aspiration that black people have in selling Mr. Floyd's death and, and, and antagonizing against it and raging against it is that look, nobody's gonna care about the poor black men. So we can, use, we can stand on their bodies to get to the middle class. We can separate ourselves from these poor, dangerous black thugs. And then the white liberals will see, hey, we're not like these black people. It's in, it's, it's in this way, right? It's in this way that there's a racial origin to class stratification in America. This is not just rich and poor. This is about deviant and civilized. And the black middle class, the black bourgeois, the black academic class, right, wants distance from that black male body. They want distance from that corpse. They'll talk about it. They'll talk about, they'll describe it as an object, but them and white people want distance from them. That's what allows them to cohere. That's what allows them to form alliances, right, with white people. And the political trajectories that we have in America doesn't want to interrupt that process of social mobility. That's why the intellectual works being appealed to. That's why the notions have been all about co uh, coalition and reform rather than actual revolution and resistance. Because unlike the 1960s and 70s, where black intellectuals saw this, the, the particular case of the United States as an outgrowth of the imperial and colonial resistance going up across the world, America sees itself as the origin that's disseminating ideologies to the rest of the world. Right? Because, because the, the, the rest of the world's looking out at the outrage of what happens on American soil. But there isn't a participation and recognition that the structural apparatus of colonialism has always been man about managing the growth of the population within the colony. And if you want to control that population, if you want to make sure that it doesn't create household wealth, that it doesn't change generation after generation and advance itself, you criminalize it, you surveil it, you destroy the myth, right? And this process is something that not a single black intellectual in the United States wants to publicly say on television. Because once you make this kind of accusation, this kind of intervention, then the whole notion of social mobility and coalition becomes a facade. Because out of all those coalitional groups that people historically point to as fighting for democracy, the one thing that's always been a problem in America has been the black men. Because when you put him in a, in a whole coalition with white people, they end up lynched. The women end up claiming that they were raped. And people say they can't work. They don't have the same interests. So the black male problem has always been at the center of coalitional reformist and liberal politics throughout the 20th century in the United States. This was the very birth of the idea that black men were patriarchs. It was, uh, it was, it was uh, Shulam and Firestone, right? Talking about the black militant as being the, the most heinous form of patriarchy. Because so think about it, the black men who have historically been exterminated take up arms to try to overthrow the society. And they're like, but that's the most violent patriarch. That's the most fearsome and dangerous male that we've ever seen on the face of the earth. But we know this language, right? We know that this is this is what feminism has said, has said for centuries about, about the black male, the savage the beast. But it's, the sad part is that today, even black people and black intellectuals have co-signed this, this historical relic to persuade people not to empathize and not to actually revolt against the dehumanization that black males are suffering in the United States right now. And it's, and it's shameful. It's truly shameful. And what do you think uh, from, from the UK? And as you know, I'm now in the US, but I'm from France. What do you think of the fact that black people in Europe I, are presently feeling the same way? They are um, like recognizing themselves in what's happening around George Floyd. They are organizing their own rallies. 
And as you said, it is a colonial structure, right? And it is not something that was started by the US because it is not, right. <laughs> yes, it, it, it is not the United States who started bringing those slaves in the American continent, right? Mm -hmm. There was no such thing in the, as the US at the time. It's just- Yeah, it didn't exist. Uh, yes, yes, yes. It, it's purely a European, white European uh, colonial mm -hmm. project. Uh, and, and all those countries are, um, former empires and former slaveholding countries, they built their fortune upon the dead bodies of the slaves and so on. So it is true that there are common points, right? There are common points between black experience in the UK, in France, in the US, and black people seems to acknowledging that, starting acknowledging that, or actually there's a long history of this acknowledgement. Yes, and, yes, yes. Um, but now it, it became really at the forefront of the, of the news. Um, so, what do you think? Do you think do you think there is there ground for for, for this, um, let's say, uh, black uh, diasporic consciousness, political consciousness? Um, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the issue isn't isn't the reaction. The issue is the lens being imported to frame the reaction. So if, if, if American gender politics and racial politics frame the way that people in Europe look at black men or Muslim men, right? Um, that becomes a problem because what's, what's taking, what's being taken from the West is not simply the outrage, but also the fear and the antipathy to the groups of people that you claim you value, right? Um, and this is actually, I'm glad when, you know, when I came to France, they told me I had to read Massad, Joseph Massad's work. And this is, this is exactly what you get, right, from him, from what he said about Muslim, right, is this, is this idea that the, the ideologies that are being transported, right, the, the into other places, carry with them the same seeds and fears of the groups of people. So you're, you're claiming that you're fighting for Black Lives Matter, but you're bringing some of that anti-Blackness with you. Mm -hmm. Right, and I've seen this in some of the debates that have been happening in South Africa about black men. I've seen a few of these things happening about surrounding some of the arguments about gender in in in, in London. Right, and these are very very dangerous sentiments because, again, the liberatory performance that you're articulating, right, that you're trying to replicate, brings with it the ideologies and the seeds of black dehumanization because you want to pick and choose. The other thing is, I think that in the UK. I think it's right that there that there's a that there's a, a, a parallel that there's a, a feeling of connectedness right to this outrage, but at the same time, for most most of the things that are happening in the UK are about toppling statues and decolonizing curricula, and right, it's the, the the civility of Europe is still being maintained. There are harsh criticisms about the UK being racist or France being racist. What institutionally changes after this moment? Let's say the UK and France get rid of all the statues. Does that mean that the violence, that the disproportionate rates of racial profiling, that the poverty, that the exclusion of, of Black intellectuals from ancient universities and from French university changes? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So, so it means, so notice, but notice, notice, we, we <laughs> become such a pacified people. We become such a pacified people. So we, we bring the outrage, but we don't, we don't want to drop a, 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 a smite of white blood. We will watch our bodies torn to corpses, but we dare not question the life of our oppressor. We dare not question the economic structures that support their civilization. Right, and this is what I'm saying. These are dishonest conversations. Right? When Fanon is talking about decolonization, he understands very clearly Right? That the civilization is enforced through bodies and economics. And that to get rid of it, you have to destroy both. But who are our intellectual leaders questioning us to not appeal to democracy, but to overturn democracy? These revolutions argue that social protest and recognition lead to a fundamental transformation of the democratic government process. That, that the, the, the rational individual 
birth with the gift of citizenship, coming along with other individuals birthed through the gift of citizenship can fundamentally change, right, through protests and, and, and pleas, the ability of the, of the government to listen to them. To, to, we to do not them. have any historical example of this work. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There are no examples of this. There are no examples of this. But yet it is framing, it is framing allegedly what is to, to, to be the most radical racial discourse, a new civil rights movement of the 21st century. A civil rights and a revolution with no bloodshed, only the dead bodies of, of mostly black men. Imagine how that will be written about centuries from now. Centuries from now. Like this, this is what I mean. We're, we have not, we are, because of the way that neocolonialism has functioned, we appeal to the preservation of the systems that are fundamentally killing us. We, we dare not imagine an end to their existence, right? We dare, we, we dare not do it. And then, and then we, we reward people with, with, with the proclamations that our citizens can, re, that, that the citizens and the institutions can respond. The optimist becomes the intellectual leader of our time because they can't imagine that the time can ever end. They can't, they can't imagine a different system of government. They can't imagine a world without the police, right? They say defund it, but let's, let's debate abolishment. What, what does it mean? What would it mean for black people to actually be in charge of institutions in French <laughs> and British societies? What, it, what, would it, what would decolonization actually look like? I'd, be, I'd love for somebody to tell me that because people talk about it all the time. Mm. Right? Uh, if I may, uh, I, I will ask a question, a naive question. Uh, I totally agree with what you said, but how to draw the attention of uh, black people and white people, and maybe more, more black than white people. Uh, it is not a question of, uh, uh, it, it, it is a question of um, the roots of this uh, structural racism coming from 1492 mm -hmm. and uh, how to draw the attention of that because because when we spoke about that the people are more interested to get uh, justice uh, defunding the police yeah, yeah. Or, and uh, we can get as you mentioned you we can get justice of course but it will not be questioned uh, question, the, the system, the system, the capitalist system will not mm -hmm. be connected with this uh, racism. And yes. out for the attention of the people, the most important uh, is to, to question this history, but also to find the way to change the systemic right. the, the approach mm -hmm. of, uh, of um, of the racialization if we want get recognition. Recognition is just not to say, oh, he is my friend, I love him, I like her, blah, blah, blah. It's not like that. Recognition is something where we, we as human, we endorse the identity of the person. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, in, a, in, a, in an epistemic, epistemological way, and uh, it's, it's not something like we see. And even the question of the statue, for me, it's, uh, I understand the, the, the rage of the people, but uh, I don't think it is the, the best way to get what we need mm. and what we want. It's a change, really, it's a change of the paradigm of domination. Right, right. And I, and I think part of the thing that sustains the paradigm of domination is the appeal to the state. Right, the appeal, the appeal to the sovereign, to to make recompense to the to the slave, that the slave asks to be let in to the to the gifts of, of the citizen, and and this dynamic has has been replicated and and rearticulated um, throughout the 20th century almost ad nauseum, because because the fundamental contradiction is that in our attempts to appeal to citizenship. Right, the same because we're asking for the same kinds of protections that we think white citizens. Do. So we're asking for race not to stain us and treat us differently than 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 white people. The problem with that is that 
in appealing to it, we co we're constantly spilling blood. It's it's we we made the same arguments with Trayvon Martin, yeah. Mike Brown, Tamir yeah. Rice, now George Floyd. So yeah. so and this is so think about this is in the last ten years. In the last yeah. ten years, we've had four marches for killing for killing a, a young boy with with a bag of Skittles, for killing a young boy in a playground with a gun, for uh, a a black boy that when that crossed the street, right? And now and now a man's lynched, lynched in, in public. So things are getting worse. They're not getting better, right? And so so the so the problem is is that we have to reeducate, right? We, and this is the important. We have to reeducate the black masses into understanding that death is the price of existing within these within these empires. We we believe. We believe that if we're recognized, that somehow all the death is going to stop. That somehow we think marching and protesting for Mr. Floyd is going to lead all the police, the police stations in the country to not kill black people anymore. And this, this is stuff of day dreams. This, this is, these, are, these are creative renderings and imaginations. This has nothing to do with reality. There's not a bit of period of time in history where these things have not happened. So we have to, we have to ground the realism. The, the statues, as you say, don't change how we're dominated, right? We have to change how we're dominated. And that may not look like an intact government. And that's certainly not going to look like an intact Trump government. Notice there's been no federal laws trying to overturn anything that the police is doing. This is all happening at local levels. The Supreme Court refused to hear any challenges to qualified immunity. So that means that the Supreme Court and the federal government wholeheartedly believe in the ability of the police to both be militarized and not have to answer to the rule of law. In that kind of situation, you're not getting any structural or institutional reform, even a paradigmatic reform to how the police is supposed to govern and interact with racialized populations. Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> I think this, this problem of uh, recognition is highly problematic here. Yes, um, absolutely. Because what are we asking for? What are we asking for when we are asking for recognition? Are we asking for something that could be achieved? Because in a way, asking for recognition is asking for more whiteness in our lives. Right? No, it is. It's, it's asking, asking for humanity. It's, it's asking for humanity. But <laughs> what I think, it, it, speculatively, we are always already recognized in a way. We are recognized. We are part of those nations. We are recognized, but we are recognized as niggers. And, and, and I don't think it is possible to ask for more. I mean, the, we are not lacking recognition. We have a form of recognition. We are part of, this, of these countries. We are part of these economies. We have a very specific place. And we Absolutely. Are, Absolutely. Uh, we are fueling this society. We are fueling the society mm -hmm. with our corpse with our, or, or we, with, our, with our work. And um, every, everyone has... has uh, his or her place in a way, right? It's not, I do not think it's about exclusion. I think it's a, it's a really well functioning society. Yeah, right? we're already I mean, integrated. It's a pathological society. Yes. It's really well organized. It's, it's really well organized. And uh, as, 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 as you said, um, there is this genocidal function. Is this genocidal function is not accidental, right? It is a form. In a way, maybe we should ask ourselves if, in white in white supremacist countries, this killing of black men and boys is not in itself a form of recognition. That is to say, a yes. form of making them what is the most useful or what is the most <laughs> like, yes. As, yes. uh, uh, as, uh, as Hegel would say, the, 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 these black males are reaching out their own concept. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> they, are, they are not still corpses, but they are, they are supposed to be corpses, right? And yes. recognition is to make them, is, is to make corpses out of them. Absolutely. That, 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 that's what's terrifying. Maybe we, we should ask for less recognition in, in a way. Yeah. Right? That, that is to say, I, I, just that, just as you said, think, try to uh, imagine things beyond beyond the state. Or, or yes, yes. That, this, that, is, this is how the society functions. This is. I, I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to emphasize <clears throat> that these are not accidental, attitudinal, you know, flourishes of of, of bad. The society is organized in such a way 
that were integrated and then excluded. And this is how this works. We're integrated as the beast, the things that civilization runs away to. It's the same kind of binary that we've seen from Rousseau and Kant debating the origin of civilization and its relationship to nature. If you take nature to be evil, within nature is always the beast. And black men have historically occupied that role in Western society. So in the system of how the world and, and, and civilization grows, the black male is what the world and the civilization moves away from. But because the black male is actually in the same geographies, he has to constantly be demonized, constantly incarcerated, constantly devalued, right? So that people do not imagine him as being a citizen, a person, an individual, a human being. So with the place that the black male plays within this logics of American democracy and government, right, is that always present of it, right? The thing that we know is there, that like I say in the book, the deposit of the negativity of civilization, but always trying to be made sure that it's pushed out of civil society, which is why you have the black male and then civilization and class stratification growing, right, from that distance. And what we've done is we've said, oh, this is just base. this is like segregation. This is like apartheid. All we have to do is integrate these people into the society. Not understanding that integration into a society does not mean the end of domination. Because in every post-segregationist and post-apartheid society, you still have the domination of black people. You still have the demonization of Muslims. You still have the extermination of indigenous people. Right, so, so there's tell, that's telling us something about the very construction of the European democratic project. And until we get our head around that artifice, right, this kind of pretense, we're still trying to act, we, we know the Europeans are liars. We know that modernity lied to us about what it intended the human to be. So why are we asking them to uphold their promises? Is this, is, if this, is this the course of what black people are going to be for the next two or 300 years? Is it gonna be more of the same where we're asking a system that kills us, incarcerates us, and impoverishes us to integrate us and treat us like one of their own? Surely we can't, surely we cannot be that silly to imagine that the history, that history only intended us to be beggars. Right? I th this is, these, these, these are the appeals, these are the appeals. I, I think regarding what you said, uh, uh, Norman, I think, for recognition, I don't think there is a recognition because for them, for the white people or the white supremacy, recognition is just equival equivalent of integration. Yeah, it is integration, yeah. And they ask, and they ask to the, if the, the, the Afro descendant of African want to be recognized, they have to be first to be, to be integrated. Mm -hmm. And they are not recognized as human. And, and it is it is a problem with these terms because it, for me it's a paradox in yes, this system. But I, I think the, the the paradox is integral to this society, and I, and I think we are always we, we are integrated, right? We we are actually integrated. It, 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 it would be like impossible to do more that, that, than what we've we've already done in order to be part of the society. We, we, we've, we've done everything. We, we've done everything we can historically to be integrated um, within this paradigm, but we have, as Sami just said, we hold this very specific function, and we exist in order to be despised or as not being integrated enough, as not being civilized enough and so on and so forth. And this is the modality of disintegration. But it, it would be, it's really hard to grasp a society, an American society, French society, English society with racial equality, right? It, it, is, it is something that is beyond our imagination, I think. And it, it is, I mean, it is even beyond the imagination of people asking um, for us to integrate in this society like if it were a, a one-sided effort towards whiteness. But there is no effort towards whiteness. It, 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 is, simple, it is simply impossible, I, I think. And this um, setting the way the conversation is framed, is framed around this 
appeal to integration and this promise of recognition, I think, is really part of what leads us to uh, problematic and impotent form of, of, of political activism and, and, and political theory. Because it's not really rooted in appeal. Yes, we are we are uh, enclosed in a false alternative between being integrated or being uh, or, or being excluded. And th the most tragic thing about this is the idea that white people are the ones who can provide us with humanity. And I think that's that's the saddest idea I, I have ever heard. Right? It, it, it's not it's not up to them. It's not up to them to decide whether we are human or not, because it's not about accessing uh, resources, right? It's not only about, about that, it's not only about accessing resources, it's not only about uh, privileges in, in society, it's not only about social uplifting or, or, or things like that. It, I, I really, I think it's something more profound and something we can achieve um, ourselves. Uh, all those things are not something that will be given to us, right? Uh, I, I think part of the history of uh, African and African diasporic thinking is about redefining what humanity is. And we are not in a situation in which we can accept the definition of the human uh, white people, Americans, French, English, are important. Yes, we, we, are, we have to go beyond this because this definition of the human is really what is, what, what is killing us right now. I mean, it, it's, the, it's the ideology, uh, it's the ideology of anti-blackness as such. I, I think that the, the greatest problem is that our political modes are based on an appeal to our oppressor. Even mm -hmm. throughout Black Lives Matter, we've, we've asked, I mean, in that, in that very statement, it's not an ontological claim, right? It's, it's, it's a political appeal. Because of Black Lives Matter, every time Black people would be killed, a Black man, a Black woman, a Black child, Black girl, a boy would be killed, that would, that would ignite the ontological right. claim, maybe the ontological claim would be black death matter or black exactly, exactly. Black, black male death matter because yes. that's that, that's what raises outrage. But exactly, <laughs> black exactly. Matter. right? Like we're, we're and the thing because because we're not talking about black life, right? We're not we're not talking about the conditions. We're not talking about the poverty. We're not talking about the disease. You know, it's it's heartbreaking because you know, let me let me tell you what upsets me about the American Academy. It's when COVID-19 broke out, there was this rush of everybody to be a specialist on it, right? People who never talk about public health, people who never concern themselves with health or any of the demographics that I, that I take very seriously in my work, right? Um, life expectancy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly the, the black academic had to create a product. It had to create something to be sold to white people to reify their expertise. So they started talking about COVID-19 and you see people floundering around of how to explain racial inequalities, right? Something, you know, my wife's whole career is based on this, this very idea that, that racism kills us through health and epigenetics. But nonetheless, overnight, we have dozens and thousands of black experts from liberal arts, mind you, um, telling us about health and disease. A few weeks later, Mr. Floyd is, Mr. Arby's killed and Mr. Floyd is killed. And there's this huge outrage. And it's almost as if it's almost as if the black academics in America breathe a sigh of relief. <sighs> Finally, a black person died. We can go back to business as normal. But now we so now we get to talk about outrage. They knew that two black men had been killed in this videotape. So now we get to talk about black women. You see, everybody's products mattered now. So the same thing they said before the pandemic matter now after the pandemic because we had a crisis. Pitting black men against black women, arguing against racism and white people, and nobody had to talk about COVID-19 because that was a new issue. 
And now we're rehearsing the same tired ideology. Nope. Say her name and intersectionality theorists have been making this argument for, for almost 10 years, right? Almost 10 years, 2013, 2014, right? And it has done nothing to stop the killing of our people. Nothing. Right. And then and notice when someone else comes up and criticizes, hey, this is a performative argument. It's not getting at the crux of how American democracies are trying to manage racialized populations. They say, well, you don't care about Miss Brianna Taylor. So the, the whole point of theorizing the apparatus and the system is useless to people who only want to focus on the rhetoric and the identity. And then we create the different kinds of tropes that have us ignore what black men and boys are actually suffering. Because if we start studying what black men and boys are actually suffering, we're starting to get to an insidious racial logic that's built into the system itself. You see, black men are not appealing for recognition. Black men are outraged because black men know that they live in a society where nobody values them, right? These bourgeois black academics trying to push and hide behind the identities of black women and black queer and black trans bodies presuppose that they can still be integrated and rewarded in the society. Because if you fundamentally believe that you could not be integrated into the society as an equal to white people, then you would have very different looking politics, right? The criticism of black nationalism was that it was too separatist, too ideological. But a lot of the people didn't believe that you could, that you could be successfully recognized as a citizen, right? This is what Newton argued in Fear and Doubt, that poor black men live in a system to be exterminated, never be integrated to live free. So if you start from that kind of positionality, you can't, you're not going to keep appealing to your oppressor for recognition. This is about class mobility. This is not about Mr. Floyd for these activists. And what I'm suggesting to us is that if we start looking at the actual conditions and situation of black people in the United States, that the death of black people is very much a needed function. It's just like A.J. William Myers said, the death of black people in the United States is necessary for dem democracy to function because it's, it's what lets white people know that they're needed and not disposable. and lets black people know that they're always disposable and not needed, right? This is the dynamic that we're working with. And there's been no theorization about this because the minute that we talk about it seriously, the minute that we talk about the operation of how empires are built and sustained, people say that you're a radical or that you're a pessimist. But look, look at the country, look at America. America had a hint of a black president and then voted in a white supremacist. The idea, the idea that a black man who was actually pretty conservative on race, didn't make any race conscious policies, was that offensive? Right? Was that offensive? He, Obama basically continued empire. He didn't make any major changes. And the, the idea that a black face was there was so offensive that it created the, the justification and the, and, the, and the seeds of Trump. Right? And I like to bring your attention to one more thing. You notice how, you notice how when Me Too happened, everybody was celebrating the peaceful protest, mm -hmm. right? The peaceful protest of these white liberal women, right? And America was celebrating. Oh, look at all the white people, all the white men who are losing their jobs. Look at all the black men we're putting in prison for sexual harassment. Yeah. Why is there, why is there such a difference between what we took to be peaceful reformation from that era, right? To the kinds of protests, death, and structures that we see in our see right now with Mr. Floyd, right? Where, what's, the, what's the outrage and difference? What is it about the dead black body that has to motivate our civil rights, our protests, where everyone seems to concede these other issues for women? This is why I don't trust white women on this and their activism in this movement. <laughs> because no, I'm serious, because when, when, when their activism became an issue, the world responded. They didn't have to get out in the streets and burn down police stations or burn down any of the institutions that, that oppressed them. They fired the people for them. The white women said, this person did something to me 20 years ago. And the mere offense of offended or the, the idea that, that you could offend a white woman was enough for people to lose their jobs. 
black people are being killed in street and videotapes and there's not a single sentiment amongst these people in power that something should happen to the people that killed them. think about that a white woman if having being offended can lose a white man his job a black person gets kneeled on the neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds and dies and people are surprised that someone's upset about it. This tells you about the value we have of black life in America. And if you can't, if we can't understand that difference, I mean, because this is, this is not high theory. This is just blanket. If we can't understand the very difference between being offended and being dead and which one gets taken care of first, we have no hope for the revolutionary potential of anybody in these countries because it speaks tremendously about what we're talking about, which is the worth of a group of people. If you think that black men are dangerous, you don't see what's wrong. My job is to make sure that we kill enough black people so that white people have a civil society to go home to. So there's no way that these people think that they're doing something wrong because that's been the unofficial code and policy of America for, for the last century, if not longer. Other people who are offended who don't see representation, who are spoken to disrespectfully, right? Have the world changed for them. So we keep, and this is what I meant when I say we keep spilling blood to appeal to democracy, to actually accept us and give us the gift of citizenship, right? Where other people operate as if they're, if, 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 as if it's their due. Right? We're not gonna have any kind of round, this is not gonna be the kind of moment people think it is. And I'm willing to bet that when these white people, when the economy picks back up, when their jobs come back, when America repairs itself, you're going to see a lot less energy supporting black people's lives actually matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, I think we, we have a, a long enough video right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. <laughs> Thank you so but much. It was fascinating. But I think we can uh, continue the conversation. And uh, I was thinking, as uh, all the people now are uh, concerned by uh, the day after, I was thinking about uh, because if you remember uh, Nils, uh, Norman, sorry, Norman, we we did uh, les rencontres uh, of France Finland Foundation in uh, London in the 2019 and uh, it was hope and day after mm -hmm. i am wondering if uh, we can make some link between this uh, this uh, reflection of the day hope and day after i was thinking about that because uh, tommy we you, you don't give us a lot of hope in, in this I, I, situation <laughs> and I i'm I sorry I, I just don't no, see no. it <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's perfect because it is it is exactly the situ the situation where where we are and we don't have to hide the where we are. Yes, yes. Uh, if we want solve, uh, if we want find a solution to solve this uh, structural, this colonialism, etc., etc. And uh, I was thinking about that to to think about hope, hope maybe hope after hope and 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 black male something like mm -hmm. that. Maybe That's to fine. see yeah. what, what do you what do you think, uh, Norman? About hope. Mm -hmm. No, hope and black black male something. Hope and black males. Uh, yeah. What do you mean? You, you, you... No, no, for the next conversation, not now, but for oh, the ah, next for conversation. conversation. Yes, I mean it. It would be it would be interesting to 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 question that because yes, we. We're now witnessing a pessimist moment, and I think yeah. it is, and, 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 and I think it is completely, completely necessary, right? And it is completely grounded in the facts. Yeah. <laughs> we have every yeah. reason, to, <laughs> we have every reason to be pessimistic. Yeah. <laughs> but I, just, I don't. I guess I don't. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just, go ahead. I didn't really interrupt you. And I think it's, and I think it's always good to to question, to question this paradox, to question this paradigm of pessimism, to question why mm -hmm. are we, why are we pessimists, and still, uh, why is there, there is necessary, necessary, there is, there is hope because in in the end of the day, 
uh, if we have this, those conversations is because we, we are not that miserable and, and because we love our people. So if, if yeah. we are in this situation, it means that there, there is necessary a form of hope, even if it's not the grandiose um, uh, narrative of uh, liberation and of uh, emancipation, which has fueled um, our, our, our history and which was maybe somehow misleading. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful idea to, uh, to have this conversation. I, I don't know what you think of, of it, Tommy. No, no, I think it'll be great. I, you know, I, I guess I tire of people lying. Um, <laughs> I, you know, you have to forgive me. I'm from a very Southern part of the country. So um, <laughs> I, listen, we, we have black intellectuals and philosophers that are lying to us about this moment and about the history of, of our thinking and thought, right? Um, this, is, this is just another example. It's not even an accumulation. It's just the example of what's been happening throughout a lot of black people's lifetimes in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, and I think that we need to ground people in that, right? Like this is not, this is not an aberration. This is very much the norm, right? Uh, and we, and I think we needed to start developing, you know, pedagogy and intellectual resources to, to focusing just on this problem. You know, this idea, this descriptive idea that we could just be black existentialists and all this other crap that and intersectionalist, this stuff, this this isn't giving us answers. Right. And it's not, it's not even, it's not even getting the problem right. You know, and I think we really need to focus on that. So yeah, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to have another conversation about that. Um, because I, I think that the, the overarching structure of how black men specifically um have had to go through this, you know, has is important, right? And this, you know, we talked about this a little bit when I was there, um, you know, about how people keep misreading Fanon, trying to make him a you know an optimist and all this other stuff, instead of dealing concretely with what he's saying, you know, which would be an end of a world, so to speak. So no, I think I think that'd be a great idea. It would be a great idea. Okay. I think it's a uh, it's enough for you because we all already we we yeah, spoke more, you have a one hour conversation more, it's okay yeah, yeah. okay okay thank you very much you. and well, uh, no it, <laughs> it will be on the France Financial website and uh, on Facebook uh, very soon I suppose okay uh, as as Dean will uh, do it thank you as Dean for that. Thank you, Dean. And uh, you, see you very soon. Absolutely. For the third, the third conversation. <laughs> All right. Whatever, no whatever the whatever the topic. Yes. Should, yes. <laughs> whatever no, the topic, you can yeah. we can you can change it. No, no. I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy to. I enjoy these. I enjoy these because I think, you know, rarely do do we get to speak to intellectuals that are like minded. You know. So, mm. yeah, I really I really enjoy the conversations and talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much to all, all of you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.